Good afternoon. Welcome back. Today's quote, out of all the 24 that I've put up in the past months, is probably the most important. Trust science, not scientists. Because as you probably know, individual scientists can do bad things. They can cheat. They can publish raw thing, wrong things. But as a field, science is always self-correcting. A good example is the Wakefield paper, which claimed that measles vaccines causes autism. He, it was basically a forgery on his part, and now it's been addressed and retracted and fixed. So that is really, if you remember me for one thing, remember that, trust science, not scientists. Today I want to talk about viral gene therapy. We are going to talk about how to use viruses to do good. And what, by viral gene therapy, I have a broader view of this than most do. In my opinion, uh, viral gene therapy is to use virus vectors to do gene therapy, which means to deliver a gene to patients who lack it or have a mutant copy of the gene. It's also, in my opinion, to deliver antigens to make a vaccine using a virus vector to treat cancers, viral oncotherapy. That's what I mean by viral gene therapy. Many people don't give it such a broad view, but it's okay. And of course, vectors, which are gonna be the topic of today, are used for research. We're not gonna talk much about that, but much of the work that we've talked about in this course uses viral vectors to do experiments. And all of this is based on a finding like this infectious DNA copies of virus genomes. None of, none of the work we're gonna talk about today could be done if you couldn't take a DNA copy of any viral genome, modify it some way, put it into cells, and have infectious virus particles come out. So we talked about this way in the beginning of this course. I'm giving you an illustration with polio virus here, but it applies to every virus that we're gonna talk about today. For polio virus, you know we can make a a DNA copy of the RNA genome, polio virus is an RNA virus, make a DNA copy of the RNA genome, and that DNA copy, when placed into cells, initiates an infectious cycle. The actual details are a little bit different for each kind of virus, as we talked about, but in the end, the principle is the same. You can modify the DNA, as we'll see today, to make it useful for gene therapy. This was basic research that people were doing with no particular goal in mind, except maybe to make some virus mutants. So this experiment on this slide I did in 1981 as a postdoctoral fellow with David Baltimore. It was the first infectious DNA clone of an animal virus. I wasn't thinking about viral vectors or making therapeutic uses of polio, I was just wanting to make mutants to study the replication cycle. But as you'll see today, this technology can be modified to make a virus to, to cure cancers. And of course, for every other virus, it's led the way to show you can make a DNA copy of your viral genome and use it. So this is an incredibly important part of what we're gonna talk about today. So let's go through some of the major viruses that are used in vectors for gene therapy and talk about how they're made and some of their properties. And we'll start with adenoviruses. This is one of our uh, favorite viruses in this course. These are rather large viruses containing double-stranded DNA genomes, and you recognize them for the fibers that stick out from each five-fold axis of symmetry. The DNA genome is shown at the bottom. We know its sequence. We know all the proteins encoded by it. We know how it works, and we're gonna show you today how we can manipulate that for good. And adenoviruses have a lot of advantages in terms of gene therapy. They, they efficiently infect post-mitotic cells. That means cells that are not dividing anymore. Most of the cells in your body are not dividing. So if you want a vector that's going to deliver a gene to them, it has to be able to infect those cells. This is pretty good at that. You have fast onset of gene expression. It remains episomal. 
It doesn't integrate into the DNA. Some of the virus vectors we're going to talk about today do integrate, and as you'll see, that can be a problem. It has a pretty big capacity. We can actually take out almost all of the virus genome. So that gives us almost 37 kilobases of coding capacity. You can easily make pure concentrated preparations. There are lots of serotypes, and there are animal adenoviruses. Why is that important? So yeah, let's say I give you an adenovirus for gene therapy, and I want to give it to you again. I can't because you're making antibodies, so you could switch serotypes. And you'll see in, in later, we actually use a chimpanzee adenovirus for uh, vaccines for that reason. And finally, that's the drawback here, that you make a really good immune response against these vectors, so you have to take that into account. Let's just look at how the vectors for adenovirus evolved over the years. The first generation vectors had E1 and E3 deleted. Try and give a little room for transgenes. So a transgene is the word I'm going to use to describe a gene that we're going to put in a virus vector. They deleted E1 and E3 because it was deemed that you didn't need those uh, to grow up the virus, where you could complement those functions in cells. You could make, for example, a cell that produces the E1 proteins and allow the vir virus vector to grow up. And E1, of course, encodes the T antigens which abrogate or antagonize RB and P53. Uh, and so we don't need that in this particular vector. And E3 encodes immunomodulatory proteins. We don't need that as well. Again, you see the trend here. We understand what these regions are doing because people are studying them over the years. So we took them out and we got some coding capacity, but it wasn't enough. And so a second generation vectors, in addition to E1 and E3 deleted, it was found that you could delete the E2 region uh, and the E4 region to give more space for the transgene. But it wasn't enough still, and so that brings us to the current generation or third generation adenovirus vectors. Everything's deleted. All the protein coding regions are deleted, and these vectors only contain the two inverted terminal repeats at each end and the psi, the packaging sequence because of course you have to get the DNA into a virus particle to make a vector. And so that's a diagram of it in the middle, and you can grow these up. You have to put some stuffer DNA in there, otherwise they don't get efficiently packaged. And then you have the two inverted terminal repeats in black, and then your psi sequence in blue there. On the bottom is an expansion of this vector, so you see how it's made. So there's the virus genome at the bottom. We've removed most of the coding region so we can replace it eventually with the therapeutic inset. Uh, and then at the right end of the vector, we have an inverted terminal repeat. At the left end, we have an inverted terminal repeat. Those are important for replication. And in the middle here is the packaging sequence, uh, which is at the left end. And that's what you need for packaging the DNA into the vector. And then transcription will begin at that red arrow and you get transcription of your insert. Now I'm going to show you a very clever manipulation that was done to get these packaged. Because now we have this, what we call a gutless vector. It doesn't encode any proteins. So how do you put it in a virus particle? Well, you simply co-infect the cell into which you've transfected that vector. But you don't want any, any helper virus, that's the one providing capsids, to contaminate your preparation. Because that'll be a wild type virus and it will infect people. So what they did, was uh, the, the helper adenovirus, which provides the capsid proteins to encapsulate the vector. The psi sequence is flanked by LOX P sites. These are sites, short nucleotide sequences, which are substrates for a recombinase called CRE. CRE will cut the LOX P sites. So we're flanking, here's the vector at the bottom. That's the, sorry, the vector is in the middle. So vector DNA, we're going to put our insert in between the ITRs and the packaging sequence. Here is the helper virus at the bottom. It's a full genome. We have put LOX P sites on either side of the packaging sequences. We've also deleted E1. And so what you do is you, you take this, uh, this virus, you make this virus, and then you're going to infect Cre cells that also produce E1. And then you're going to transfect your vector into this as well. So what's going to happen is 
Uh, this genome is going to provide capsid proteins to package the vector, but it itself will not be packaged because the Cree recombinase in these cells are going to cut out the packaging sequence from the helper virus, because only the helper virus has LOX P sites around it. So that gives you a preparation of vector only, virus particles with your gene in them, and no helper virus that would be a problem. So you can do these kinds of manipulations, if you're clever enough, to uh, get a vector that's free of helper. All right, so that's adenovirus vectors. Now, there is a very interesting recent development to get around this problem of immunity, which is you infect someone with a vector, an ad vector, and they make antibodies so you can't go back to them. And so we now understand how antibodies against adenovirus neutralize infectivity. And there's two ways that they neutralize infectivity. They're both shown here. One on the left, these little yellow uh, Ys, those are the antibody molecules bound to the virus particle. And one neutralization mechanism, the antibodies bind the virus particle. And that allows complement proteins to bind the antibodies. We talked about complement a while ago. These are serum proteins that interact with the adaptive immune response. And so this virus particles, they're bound by antibodies, they're bound by complement protein. Those are taken up into the cell by endocytosis. Now normally adenovirus gets out of the endosome as the endosome pH drops, one of the adenovirus proteins pops out of the virus particle, pokes holes in the endosome, and then the virus particle comes out. The presence of complement on the virus particle locks the capsid so it can't uncoat. So these viruses remain uh, in the endosome. The other mechanism is shown on the right. These are antibodies bound to virus particles. If there's no complement around, they get taken up into endosomes. They will penetrate out of the endosome by the normal mechanism. Protein 6 is liberated from the virus particle. It pokes holes in the endosome, and the particle ends up uh, out into the cytosol. We talked about this a long time ago. There's a protein in the cytosol called TRIM21, which will recognize the antibody bound to the particle, cause the virus to become ubiquitinated, and that directs it to the proteasome for degradation. All right, so these are two different mechanisms of neutralization by antibodies, two different ways that the antibodies prevent infection. And so how do we get around this? Well, people have found that if you make antibodies that com are composed of just the FAB portion, you cut the FC portion of the antibody away, that's the part of the antibody that interacts with complement proteins and with TRIM21. So you coat the virus in FABs, and now it will not be subject to neutralization by either complement or TRIM21 mediated pathways. So this was just published a few months ago, and it's likely that trials will be undertaken where they coat the vector with FAB fragment. They're non-neutralizing because the FC is not present to interact with complement or TRIM21. Another vector that's very popular is adenovirus-associated viruses. These are also viruses we talked about in this course. They are, the capsids are icosahedral. They're small DNA viruses with a single-stranded genome with the unusual hairpins at either end that are involved in uh, DNA replication. And these encode only two proteins, a rep protein involved in DNA synthesis, recruiting the, the cellular DNA synthesis apparatus to replicate the viral genome, and the capsid protein. And so these are very popular uh, for gene therapy because you get long-term gene expression for some reason that we don't quite understand when you infect cells with these viruses or animals, the gene expression remains for a long, long time. There are also multiple serotypes, which is good if you want to go back and infect. So here is the one way that we can modify these vectors to introduce genes. So we have the genome of adenovirus-associated virus on the top with the inverted terminal repeats, the rep, and the cap open reading frames. You can basically cut out all of the coding region and substitute your transgene in for it. And then, of course, you have to get that packaged. So what you do is you transfect that DNA into cells along with a plasmid that encodes only the rep and the cap gene. So they will provide replication functions and capsids to, to package the vector DNA. In addition, because this is a 
adenovirus dependent virus. It requires adenovirus as a helper all the time. You have to add adeno functions, helper functions. We know what they are, so we don't have to actually infect these cells with adenovirus. We can provide the genes on plasmids, and those genes include the E1, E2, E4, and VA genes. So we know four adenovirus genes involved in helping AAV. We put plasmids encoding those in as well. And what comes out are particles, recombinant AAV particles, that have your transgene in them. And we'll talk of uh, today about an example of using this to cure blindness. And you can modify these vectors in very interesting ways. Here's one example. We know there are many different AAV serotypes. And so these lines, colored lines on the upper left, those are capsid genes from the different serotypes. And we can clone them as DNAs, and we can change them to make new serotypes. We can mutagenize them by inserting or changing amino acids throughout the coding region. We can shuffle bits of each capsid amongst each other to make recombinants, or we can insert peptides. And then you can do this on a massive scale and simply infect cells with those modified viruses, take the viruses you get out, and you can pass them over a column which is to which is attached antibodies to all of the original AAVs. Any new AAV serotype will pass through the column. It won't be bound by the antibodies. And so now you have a new crop of AAVs, which are new serotypes. You can test them in mice. You can grow them in cell cultures. You can repeat this if you want to make even more. And people are doing this. It works. You can generate new serotypes that are not recognized by antibodies raised against the original AAV serotypes. Retroviruses are very popular as vectors. Here are two retroviruses that are used in uh, gene therapy, we have retroviruses with simple genomes, like Rouse sarcoma viruses, and retroviruses with complex genomes, like HIV. And we can modify these to insert genes. I have a series of exclamation points here to remind you. This is HIV, which has infected tens of millions of people, caused many millions of deaths, and we're using it for gene therapy. How amazing is that? Whenever you read an article about the use of these lentivirus vectors, they always point out, we use HIV to repair this gene. I think it's remarkable. Now, of course, we got the genome. We take everything out that makes it HIV, except for the LTRs. But still, we've, we've learned how to modify it so it doesn't cause disease. As I said, you can use lentiviruses, HIV, or other retroviruses. HIV is really desirable because it will infect post-mitotic cells. And the other retroviruses with simple genomes do not. So depending on your application, you, you may need to use HIV. You get long-term expression, of course, because the provirus is integrated into the DNA. You can get up to eight kilobases of inserts. However, this vector can integrate and cause mutagenesis. It could, for example, insert into a gene and disrupt it, which wouldn't be good. Or, as we'll see, it could sit next to an oncogene and turn it on and cause cancer. And that's happened also. And so we've learned that we have to do things to the rightward LTR to inactivate its promoter so it doesn't cause activation of uh, neighboring genes. And finally, we can pseudotype these virus particles with the glycoprotein from VSV. Instead of having the retroviral glycoproteins on the particles that we get, we use the VSV glycoprotein because that can infect almost every cell. It has a very broad tropism. And here's how you make such vectors. You have initially two plasmids. On the top left is a capsid plasmid, which encodes the GAG and Paul genes. The GAG, all the structural proteins. And the Paul, of course, is the reverse transcriptase, RNA-SH integrase. And uh, you co-transfect that into cells with an envelope plasmid, encoding the glycoprotein. If you do that, you get particles that don't have genomes in them. Those proteins are enough to drive the production of virus particles. You get envelope particles with the viral glycoprotein in them and the RT and the protease, et cetera, inside. If you want to put a transgene in, you use a third plasmid, capsid plasmid envelope and transgene. Now, here, you can substitute the VSV glycoprotein 
here instead of using the retroviral glycoprotein and get a broadly tropic virus. And then you have your transgene where you have whatever gene you want flanked by two LTRs. And then you have a promoter, of course, in the first LTR that'll drive expression. You make, you transfect all three of these plasmids into cells. You get out retrovirus particles containing your foreign gene. And of course, this transgene has to have a packaging sequence for the retrovirus as well. And that's, that gets it packaged into the particle. Vaccinia viruses, pox viruses, are also used as vectors. A popular one is called modified vaccinia virus on CARA MVA. Uh, this is a replication defi deficient vector. It's derived from the smallpox vaccine, which is a vaccinia virus vaccine. And this has been passaged extensively in chicken cells and so that it, it will infect bird cells, but not mammalian cells. It will replicate in them. It has an assembly block because of the passage in avian cells. The advantages of this, you can work with it under BSL-1 conditions, biosafety level one, the lowest possible conditions. And it has a large capacity. There are other pox viruses that are used. A canary pox virus, for example, has been used in some uh, HIV vaccine trials, similar principle. And you can introduce genes into these viruses readily. And the way you do it is shown here. You take a plasmid and you clone your transgene into it. We call this a shuttle vector. We transfect that into cells, which we then co-infect with MVA, or canary pox virus. Uh, the DNA, the transgene is flanked by viral sequences, so it drives recombination into the MVA genome. It's very easy to get your recombinants out. You can look for them by sequencing. And you have then a recombinant MVA, which has your gene of interest. So simply by infecting and transfecting cells, you get out the recombinants that you want. All right, so that's a list of some of the vectors I've told you. There are retroviruses, lentiviruses, AAV, and adenoviruses. Some of the advantages in terms of capacity and tropism and genomic persistence and some of the disadvantages uh, are, are shown on the right, including uh, oncogenic potential for the retroviruses uh, and so forth. Let's talk a little bit about now the applications of uh, some of these vectors for gene therapy. This is a, a slide that's a few years old now, but it's a summary of indications that are being addressed by gene therapy and the kinds of vectors uh, that are being used. So on the left, these are the kinds of diseases that are being addressed. So the, the N is the number of trials that were or are underway, for example, to use virus vectors in cancers. So you can see cancers is the biggest numbers, 1,300 plus trials ongoing to use virus vectors to treat cancers, 64% of all applications. And then the others are, are much fewer, monogenic diseases, infectious diseases, and a variety of other diseases. We will talk about ocular diseases today, but you can see a wide range of diseases are being addressed by using virus vectors. Again, these are all being studied using virus vectors. And the vectors being used are shown at the right. The most popular is adenovirus. 22% of all the trials use adenovirus, uh, followed by retroviruses. Many people use naked DNA especially in vaccination, instead of putting in a virus vector. Vaccinia virus, AAV, lentiviruses, pox viruses, herpes simplex. So that gives you an idea. The way this works, there are two general ways that we use viruses to treat human diseases. On the left is the first, it's called direct delivery. You make your vector in ways that I've told you, and many other ways as well, but you take your gene, and you package it into a virus, and you simply inject it into the patient. That virus, depending on how you inject it, if you put it in the blood, it's, it's likely going to go to the liver first. So where you need to treat is an important determinant of whether you'll do that or not. And we'll see today there are some applications where you might want to treat cancers by injecting the virus directly into the bloodstream. Immunization, perhaps, you could put a virus directly intramuscularly. But in other cases, you want to be more specific, and that's shown on the right, which is called cell-based delivery. And, and this is one iteration 
uh, where we're taking stem cells. Uh, so we can either remove stem cells from a patient, and now we, we used to have to do this from the bone marrow, uh, or get another donor of bone marrow, but now we know how to purify uh, hematopoietic stem cells, for example, from the blood, so we can remove those from the patient and culture them, or you can take uh, other cell lines that have been banked, which have similar properties. But the idea is that you would then infect them in culture with your vector, and then establish an infection in those cells. And of course, you're using vectors that are not killing the cells, but perpetuating in them and producing the therapeutic protein. And you do this in culture, you ascertain that the cells are infected and producing the protein, and then you reintroduce those into the patient. You infuse them back in, and then those, if they're stem cells, they're gonna differentiate to form whatever the products are, and they'll be expressing the therapeutic gene. And we'll, we'll look at an example of that today. So let's talk about a couple of vaccine applications first of vectors. This is one we have already talked about when we talked about HIV and AIDS. This is using adeno-associated ve virus vector. And in this, we've cloned the gene encoding a broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibody, which was recovered uh, from people. And you see, this is taking all of the AAV genome out, except for the ends, as I told you. You've replaced it with uh, sequences, including the heavy and the light chain. That's made into a virus vector. And in this experiment, humanized mice were infected with this vector. The mice make antibodies. They make these broadly neutralizing antibodies for years, or months at least, because the mice only live a couple of years. So this is the advantage of AAV, persistent infection. And on the right is the effect of this. Uh, these mice producing this antibody directed by the AAV vector were challenged every week for three weeks with HIV. And you can see it, the, the mice receiving a luciferase containing vector, that's the control. They all got infected and they have a lot of HIV copies per mil. And the red mice are all resistant to infection. They're the ones that are uh, immunized initially with the AAV vector. And again, on the bottom is percent uninfected. You can see the mice receiving the antibody in the, in the form of an AAV are all protected from infection. This is now going into humans in a phase one trial. And as I said, if it works, we'll probably combine broadly neutralizing antibodies. It remains to be seen, though, if we will get as robust production of antibodies in people, if we do, if that's a problem, and so forth. That's why we need to do a phase one. This is another example of a, a HIV therapeutic, uh, and this is a preliminary study which uses a macaque model. And so macaques can be infected with SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, and they develop an immunodeficiency disease, very much like AIDS. And in this experiment, the investigators have used a rhesus cytomegalovirus vector. So CMV, you remember, is one of the viruses that causes persistent infections in us. And it's desirable as a vector because of that property. Of course, you have to take away its capacity to cause disease, but you can modify the vector to do that. There are rhesus equivalents, macaque equivalents of CMV. And so that's what was used here. And this vector uh, contains the viral glycoprotein coding region. So you immunize these macaques, and then you challenge them with SIV. And the results are shown here. This is time after infection, and it's up to a year. And then we have the plasma viral load. This is an ex interesting experiment, which remains unexplained to this day. Half of the immunized animals were resistant to infection. You can see those are the colored lines here at the bottom. So they're, they're called, uh, those are the controllers on the right here with all these different colored bars. But half were completely susceptible. And both groups, were, they were all immunized with the vector. So the good news is that half of the monkeys were resistant to infection after being given this vector. The bad news is the other half were not, and we're not sure why. But anyway, this is a promising approach that's being uh, followed up. And finally, I want to tell you about an Ebola virus vaccine that uh, is currently being used. Uh, first, this is an example of an, an Ebola virus vaccine, uh, which is in clinical trial at the moment. Uh, it's made by GlaxoSmithKline together with NIH. And this is composed of uh, adenovirus plus MVA vectors. 
And so what is done here is to clone the glycoprotein of Ebola virus uh, into, for example, a chimp adenovirus vector. Chimp because humans don't have antibodies against it. No matter what adenovirus serotype you used, you wouldn't know if the people you're giving it to have antibodies, so the easiest thing is to use a chimp vector. And you can see two different doses. These are monkeys, these are macaques that are uh, immunized and then challenged intramuscularly with Ebola virus, so these are done in BSL-4 facilities. And you can see the chimp adeno vaccine doesn't give you great protection, even at the highest dose, only 50%. So then they tried prime boosts with chimp ad, not very good, tried changing the serotype of the chimp ad from three to 63, no good. But when they combined a prime chimp ad three with MVA boost, that's the pox virus vector I told you about, then you get 100% protection. And so now, that, as I said, this has uh, gone into people. However, the vaccine that's currently being used uh, in DRC is an Ebola virus uh, vaccine vectored by VSV. So they took the VSV genome and substituted the glycoprotein uh, with the glycoprotein of Ebola virus. So this is VSV Ebola. It's mostly VSV with just the glycoprotein of Ebola virus. In a macaque model, uh, these animals are immunized with VSV EBOV, and then they are challenged intranasally with 1,000 PFU 28 days after immunization. And this is percent survival. This is the control group, they're all dead uh, by eight days or so. So they've received a vector with no glycoprotein in it. And the animals that have the VSV EBOV vaccine, they're all protected. So based on this and other data, this vaccine was used in the 2015 outbreak uh, in Western Africa. And this is the paper that uh, described it. I just spoke with uh, Marie-Paul Keeney last week about this. This was uh, effectiveness of recombinant VSV vectored vaccine. And this was an open label cluster randomized trial called Ebola Sasufi. Ebola, that's enough. It's a great name for a clinical trial. So they took 2,119 contacts and contacts of contacts. So this was a modified ring. So you'd have an Ebola patient, you'd get their contacts and the contacts of the contacts and vaccinate them all. But they didn't want to do a placebo because they felt it would be unethical. So instead of a placebo, they just delayed the vaccination. 2119 immediately were vaccinated and 2000 were vaccinated 21 days later. And they compared the incidence of disease in the two groups. No cases after 10 days or more after the immediate vaccination. Uh, 16 in the delayed cluster. So that's the control, if you will. The comparing an immediate vaccination to delayed. And based on these numbers, it was declared to be 100% uh, efficacious. Now, at the end of this trial, the, the outbreak stopped. So they didn't get a lot of data from it. Now, of course, there is a big outbreak in DRC, which started last August. Uh, so far, 1,500 cases and almost 1,000 deaths. The VSV EBOV vaccine, the same one that was used in West Africa, it's being used uh, in this outbreak since August. It's provided free by Merck. Uh, they have distributed 66,000 doses so far, and they have another 120,000 on the way. It's not been as effective. This outbreak is still ongoing. And again, they're doing a modified ring approach, but there's been a lot of conflict and if you read the news, you see that often the people trying to immunize, which is the situation here, they're outside in tents immunizing people, and uh, people come in and shoot them. And so this is interfering with uh, immunization, of course. And so uh, that and maybe other factors have made it not uh, as good as, as it was in the Western African outbreak. So this outbreak continues. Nevertheless, an example of how you can use vectored approaches to deliver vaccines. And my understanding is that this will be licensed pretty soon. Okay, so that's vaccines. Let's talk about monogenic diseases. These are diseases caused by a mutation in one gene. You can identify such mutations and plot the inheritance pattern of dominant or recessive. There are over 6,000 different such diseases. In fact, one out of 200 live births has a monogenic Disease. And these are amenable to viral gene therapy because you can put the wild-type gene 
back into these patients, and there are over 1,800 clinical trials ongoing to deliver genes to these individuals. I want to tell you just about a few of them, not all 1,800. And here are some of the diseases that are amenable to gene therapy. They're monogenic, one gene. If you have more than one, it's more difficult. We need to prove that this works first with monogenic diseases. We're going to talk a little bit about SCID. This has been in the news lately. You've seen headlines about the bubble boy, which is the name they gave to this, the original patient in the 80s. He was born and put immediately into a plastic uh, shroud so that he wouldn't be infected. Uh, so that's amenable to gene therapy using retroviruses. Uh, and here are some others. Uh, we're going to talk about this uh, retinal degenerative disease, which uses AAV, X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy, which has been done. And the others you can see, they're all amenable. And the frequencies here uh, tells you uh, why we're doing this. The first uh, gene therapy was in 1993 for cystic fibrosis. And these patients, which get a lot of lung infections, they have a defect in the cystic fibrosis transporter gene. And they can have a, a variety of different mutations. This individual uh, was a 23-year-old with a homozygous deletion in the CFTR gene. Cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. And they produce an adenovirus. This is a first generation adenovirus with the wild type DNA. And they put two times 10 to the eighth PFU to the airway epithelium of this patient. Here's the patient here. And they're inserting a tube into the lung and spraying the adenovirus into the lung. And they did that three times. And the results are shown here. And you can see each time we're measuring the amount of transgene that's produced in the lung. And the first time you get a nice burst of, of a wild type protein, and the second time a little less, and then the third time it didn't work at all. And what do you think is going on there? Look at the time scale. 30 days, 30 days, 30 days. It's making antibodies against the virus. By the third immunization, the vector is being neutralized, so it can't produce protein. It's the same vector they gave this patient every time. We didn't know uh, if this would be an issue, and it obviously is. So from this early days, it's, the, the field has progressed, and we've made a lot of modifications. Unfortunately, in 1999, there was the first uh, setback. A, a person died, the first person to die in a, a gene therapy clinical trial. It's a very well-known patient, Jesse Gelsinger, who was 18 years of age. He had a disease called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, and he was a heterozygote, so he had a mild form of the disease, but he and his father thought it would be good to enroll in this trial. Uh, so he enrolled in the trial at UPenn. He was given an adenovirus vector with a wild-type gene. Unfortunately, he died four days after receiving the injection of the vector. He had um, a massive immune response against the virus and multiple organ failure. An investigation of this revealed that Penn had violated a, a variety of rules of contact in this uh, trial. They had probably given him too much virus and so forth. You can, you can find it all online. It's all there, very clear. In fact, there are long articles written by his father as well. It's quite, quite moving. So because of this, program at Penn was stopped for a while, and we had to back up. But then it resumed again with a trial to treat X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency. This is the bubble boy disease, where you don't have any immune system, essentially. You have a defect in T cells, B cells, and NK cells. That's why the boy was put in a plastic bubble, so he wouldn't be infected. And on the right here are the ver various mutations that we see. These are X-linked genes. And this is the IL-2 receptor gamma chain. And so that's uh, all these symbols are various mutations that have been identified in different patients with uh, this disease. So they can occur in different parts of the protein and they block its function essentially. So inactivation of this protein leads to this disease. So the idea arose, let's give the wild type IL-2 receptor gamma chain gene to patients. And so two trials were started in London and Paris giving infants a retrovirus with a normal gene. 
So these are infants now. They're very young because you're diagnosed early on with the disorder. And you know, if you're not put in a bubble, you're going to die very quickly from infections. So you have to give this therapy very early on. Uh, and so what they did is they took CD34 positive bone marrow, hematopoietic precursor cells out of the patients. They transduced them with the vector, and then they put them back into the patient. Th this worked, and it supplied gene function, but unfortunately, four out of nine uh, infants in Paris and one in London developed T-cell leukemia three to six years uh, after the treatment. Now, the, the treatment worked, so they were able to live normal lives, but years later, they got leukemia, and a study of them showed that the vector had integrated next to an oncogene. So you remember when we talked about transformation, we talk about how some cases, viruses, retroviruses, can integrate next to an oncogene. The right-hand LTR then turns on the transcription of the oncogene, and you get cancer. So that's what happened here. So at the time, there were 27 different trials with retroviral vectors ongoing. They're all stopped until we figured out, oh, we have to probably inactivate the right-hand LTR so we don't do that. And so this has been fixed. And now uh, you have seen in the news lately uh, the reporting of this paper, New England Journal article just came out, lentiviral gene therapy combined with a, a drug in infants with SCID-X1. So they took eight infants with skid they gave them bone marrow transplants with the same uh, lentiviral vector, but modified so it won't give them leukemia. And after 18 months, they all have functional B and T cells, so, it's, so it worked. And so this is what the headlines are saying. HIV used to uh, cure bubble boy disease, and that's because it's a modified uh, HIV vector, of course. Another disease that's been addressed is X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. These patients have a defect in a transporter called the ABC. D1 transporter, and that causes fatty acid buildup and damage to myelin. So you can see the myelin damage on the right scan there, the white areas. And so they took out bone marrow, stem cells from these patients. They infected them with a lentivirus vector containing the normal gene, gave it back to them. The cells are reinfused, of course, and in these patients, it resolved the demyelination. On the left here is one of the patients after therapy. And these patients also have neurological issues, which I'm not discussing, but these uh, either stabilized or improved. So this was deemed to work uh, as well. Uh, the one that's been licensed is to treat blindness. And there are a lot of what we call inherited retinopathies. Uh, and these are untreatable blinding conditions. Up till now, we, we haven't been able to do anything for these individuals. Uh, they are monogenic. And they are mutations in a variety of genes involved in eyesight. And those are shown at the bottom right here. So here's a, a diagram of the, the retina. And there's your retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, and then you have a variety of genes which can be altered in these patients, either in the RPE, in the cones, the rods, and the variety of, of neurons below, even the ganglia. And so the goal has been to introduce wild-type versions of these genes into patients using AAV vectors or other vectors. Uh, here, this, these columns show you AAV, lentiviral, and adenovirus trials delivering, for example, genes that are defective in the retinal pigment epithelium or any of these other cells that lead to blindness. And the way this is done is to actually inject the virus into the retinal epithelium. You put a needle through the eyeball and go to the back of the eye, and hopefully you have a steady surgeon doing this, and you inject the virus, and because it's AAV, you have long-term expression uh, of the protein. And these were tested, of course, in, in animal models. AAV so far has been the most promising of the vectors. Uh, and in one particular disease called Leber congenital amaurosis, they have mutations in the RPE65 gene. That's a gene in the RPE, the retinal pigment epithelium. It's required for photoceptor function, so these people are blind. In dogs, a single injection restored visual function. And so uh, it was put in humans and uh, approved by the FDA in 2017. It's called Lux Turna. And Catherine High uh, was a physician at Penn who was involved in the development of this. She's since left and started a company, but I interviewed her on TWIV 350 to talk about uh, this development. So that's a nice ending to this story. I think I, I saw an interview with one of the kids 
who got this therapy and he said, I saw my mother for the first time. So we have quite a few uh, successes in monogenic ther therapy and clinical trials. I've told you about SCID uh, and Lieber congenital amaurosis, but there are others, ADA, hemophilia, beta thalassemia, lipoprotein lipase. So as time moves on, we'll do more and more of these and get better and better at it. And so you'll be seeing these in use for sure in the future. How about tumors? Let's talk about killing cancers with viruses, which we call viral oncotherapy. And we use different kinds of viruses for this. Sometimes we use animal viruses that don't infect people, but for some reason they replicate in human tumors. And that includes myxoma virus, a pox virus, Seneca Valley virus, a picornavirus. Sometimes we modify human viruses so that they target tumors and kill them. And sometimes we add genes to enhance it. And I'll tell you a little bit about that today. We can target vectors to tumors in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, the measles virus, glycoprotein, the HA, has been modified to target tumor markers. Now, tumors may express unique proteins, right, because their genome is mutated. They express so-called neoantigens, which aren't in other tissues because they are mutated, and you can identify those and use them to target your vectors. We have uh, modified the herpes simplex virus glycoprotein to contain either IL-13 or single-chain antibodies against uh, receptors that are present on a variety of cancers. In adenovirus, we can insert domains that recognize tumor antigens either into the fiber or the protein that is around the hexons. Or we can, instead of modifying the vector, we can use adapters that will bind the fiber of adenovirus and retarget it to a different receptor. So there are many, many approaches ongoing, especially in the oncotherapy, viral oncotherapy field to redirect viruses to be specific for tumors. So that's at the level of entry. We can also do post-entry targeting. And here are two examples of that. On the top, we have positive targeting. We have a oncolytic virus vector, and it's going to express some gene that will be toxic for the tumor or genes. And we pick a promoter that doesn't work in normal cells. It will only work in a tumor cell. So when that virus enters a normal cell, the genes are not expressed, it doesn't do anything to the cell, doesn't replicate. But in a tumor cell, we have picked the promoter to work in tumor cells, and so the promoter functions and oncolytic proteins are made. So that's positive targeting. We're modifying the virus to replicate in the tumor cells. We have negative targeting, shown on the bottom, and this uses microRNAs. The idea here is we pick a microRNA that is present in normal cells but not in tumor cells. And then we introduce the target of the microRNA into the vector. So the idea is if the microRNA is present, it will bind the target in the vector and destroy it. So you want a microRNA that is present in normal cells but not in tumor cells. It's very easy to find that. You just screen cells using uh, northern blots. An example of that is shown on the right here. These are two microRNAs, LET7A and MIR124A. And you can see the LET7A is in a number of cells and tissues. It's not in a tumor cell line, Entera2. So that would be a good candidate for this because this vector would be destroyed in most normal cells and not in the tumor. And there is a MIR-124A that's more restricted. So it's a negative approach that you're destroying the vector in normal cells, allowing it to reproduce in tumor cells where there's no microRNAs present. We can also put a variety of genes into these vectors. And one of them, uh, we can put in prodrug convertases. And the problem is that it's hard to infect 100% of the cells in a tumor. Even if you inject it, you're not going to get all the cells but why not make something that will diffuse throughout the tumor and help kill the rest of the tumor? So we can put in prodrug convertases. These are genes that encode proteins that will activate a drug. And we have talked about this before, the herpes simplex thymidine kinase gene. It's not present in normal cells. And uh, if you put it in a oncolytic virus vector and then give the person, well, if you gave them acyclovir, we don't actually use that, the tumor cells that produce the TK would activate the drug and it would be specific for tumor cells. So that's how 
TK activates acyclovir by putting on a phosphate. We talked about that before. We also can put ion transport protein genes into these vectors and immunostimulatory factors. Talk about specific examples. Now, myxoma virus is an example of a virus that we are thinking about using to treat cancers. This is the same myxoma virus that was released in Australia to try and kill the rabbits. But it doesn't replicate in us. It doesn't replicate, but it will replicate in some tumor cells. In fact, many types of human cancer cells. And so that's, that's an example of how we use an animal virus that doesn't infect us, but will infect our tumors. And we don't know exactly why, but sometimes tumor cells don't make an antiviral response. They don't make a good interferon response, and so they're susceptible. Uh, sometimes the pathways that are activated that lead to transformation allow for virus replication. And so what's being done here is to ask, can we use this virus to treat tumors either ex vivo or in vivo? So for example, let's say you wanted to take, take a person's bone marrow out and eventually give it back to them. So you, you would say, take a person's bone marrow out, lethally irradiate them to destroy all of their bone marrow, and then put their bone marrow back to reconstitute. And then the lethal irradiation will get rid of their tumors. Of course, the bone marrow may have cancer cells in it. And so one application of myxoma would be to infect the bone marrow cells ex vivo and get rid of the tumor cells. So this virus will not infect the normal cells, but it will infect the cancer cells. And you can see two experiments here with two different kinds of cancers where they put these cells in, 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 a, in a dish, infect them with myxoma, and then they put them back in mice. And you can see in this case, 100% of mice were free of human uh, multiple myeloma cells because they were killed in vitro by the myxoma virus. In other experiments, these other three with different kinds of cancers, they implant the tumor, the tumor cells into mice, it grows as a tumor, and then they inject with myxoma virus, and they can see uh, the tumors being destroyed. So the other one that is an interesting animal virus is Seneca Valley virus, which is a picornavirus. This is a virus identified in 2002 as a contaminant of cell culture medium. We think it either came from a bovine serum or porcine serum, which we use in cell culture. Uh, this virus causes disease in pigs, but not in humans, although humans can seroconvert. We know that people who work on pig farms have antibodies to this virus. A, a company decided to start working on this and found that it has a selective tropism with certain kinds of cancers. As you can see here, small cell lung cancer is one that's highly untreatable. And so the idea was, let's do a trial. It went through a phase one trial in 2006, shown to be safe. But two phase two trials for different kinds of cancers did not meet the efficacy endpoints. And so they wanted to figure out why. Now we've gotten interested in this because this is a picornavirus and we have worked on picornaviruses my whole career. So we've decided to start working on SVV. It turns out that these tumors that they treated in these trials made an interferon response that inhibited the virus. And so this is an experiment where they looked at 82 tumor cell lines. The receptor for this virus is called TEM8, tumor endothelial marker 8. It also happens to be the anthrax toxin receptor. They took uh, 82 TEM8 positive cell lines. 20 of these turned out to be susceptible to infection, uh, and they're permissive, and the others were refractory. And the ones that are refractory, even though they all have TEM8, they're refractory because they upregulate innate immune response genes. And this is shown by this heat map here. The bottom line is if you look at permissive versus non-permissive cells, so they all have the receptor. A fraction of them are non-permissive because they're making interferon in response to infection. So from this, the idea has arisen, can we blunt the interferon response and use this as a vector to destroy tumors? One of the ideas is that uh, we use a drug called storosporine which inhibits stat phosphorylation. Remember, when interferon binds its receptor, it starts a signaling cascade leading to the transcription of ISGs. Storosporine will block this signaling. And storosporine is an FDA-approved drug. So here's an experiment we did in the lab. We're looking at the growth of Seneca Valley virus. And we have, here's the growth from time zero to 24 hours. You can see we get a couple of logs of virus production. 
If you treat the cells with interferon, you block virus replication. But if you treat them with interferon plus storosporine, you restore virus replication. You actually increase it over the untreated cell. So again, storosporine is blunting the interferon response. And so we're doing some mouse experiments now to see if this would be a viable option for getting this virus to work in certain kinds of tumors. We're also going to insert genes into these viruses that are known to blunt the immune response, like a flu virus gene, a dengue virus gene, or microRNAs that reduce interferon and perhaps use genetically modified SVVs. So the idea would be you have a patient with a tumor, you first see if it's TEM8 positive, which means it has the receptor for SVV, and then you can treat it with the virus. It's a completely unmodified virus. It's just an animal virus. You give it also storosporine or another route that we're trying are HDAC inhibitors, which blunt the innate immune response, uh, and or treat with uh, SVV that's been modified. Now, the, the good thing about point two is that HDAC inhibitors and storosporine are FDA approved. So the path to getting that kind of oncotherapy approved is, is a lot shorter. Measles virus has been used to treat uh, some kinds of cancers. And the interesting thing is here that you can use the vaccine strain. The vaccine strain is an attenuated infectious vaccine, the one that every many people are objecting to getting, by the way. That's why we have big outbreaks. Guess what? It might be able to cure your cancer. I wonder if people would take it for cancer then and not, not have gotten it as a vaccine. Anyway, uh, the, the attenuated vaccine preferentially replicates in tubers because the passaging to attenuate the virus lost its ability to antagonize innate responses. They've modified the vector to include a gene for a trans symporter, the human sodium iodide symporter. Why did we put that in? Because uh, if you give the virus to patients, you can also give them gamma-emitting isotopes. So you can see then, you can image and see where the virus is in the tumor. The, the, if you give them beta-emitting isotopes, it will cause poisoning of the tumor. And these are taken up through this uh, symporter kind of a, a channel that will bring them into the cell. And so here is one trial of two patients with multiple myeloma. So multiple myeloma is a cancer uh, which is characterized uh, by a couple of features. One is that you have uh, clonal B cells, plasma cytoma cells. So these are fax plots of patient one and patient two. And, and normally plasma cytomas are very heterogeneous now, these are the antibody-producing cells, but in a multiple myeloma, they're clonal. And so you can see here, clonal plasma cytomas in patient one and two. They infuse these patients with uh, 10 to the 11th particles of measles virus intravenously. And um, you can see after treatment, the clonal PCs are gone on the patient one uh, and in patient two. And one of these patients had a, a mass on their, fore, on their forehead uh, which you can see in, in these um, uh, radiograms here. So here's the mass in the upper right, and it's on the right front of the skull there. And so that's pre-treatment and post-treatment, you see it's gone down considerably. So just one infusion of 10 to the 11th measles virus particles. And this also got a lot of coverage uh, as well. One of these patients, they were giving her these particles IV, and of course that's a lot of particles, and you can get a very rapid onset of fever. So her fever was going up, and they said, now we have to stop this. And she said, God damn it, don't you stop. Nothing else has worked for me. So they continued it, and uh, one of the two had at least had complete remission. Herpes virus has been approved for treatment of melanoma. This is a herpes virus called telimogene laherparavec. Laherparavec. I, I did practice this, but I can't get it right. I call it TVEC. And this is herpes simplex. It has a gene for GMCSF. And this, the protein will stimulate the production of granulocytes and macrophages, so you get better adaptive immunity against the tumor. This is another approach that people are taking besides putting a drug convertase in. Uh, this virus has been deleted for a gene, two genes that causes it to be specific for tumors. It's deleted for ICP-47. 
ICP-47 normally inhibits antigen presentation. Take it away, now antigens are going to be displayed in MHC, and the CTLs can recognize the tumor cells. Uh, this went through a phase three, phase one, two, and three for melanoma. It's injected right into the tumor. People who got the vector had a 16% response uh, versus 2% for GMCSF alone without a vector. So this was approved in 2015. It's called Imligic, marketed by Amgen for melanoma. It's not the best, but it's slow steps towards getting to something better. There are two very cool adenoviruses that have been licensed for treating tumors. One is called CG0070. Uh, this includes the gene for GMCSF. This virus replicates in RB deficient tumors. And most cancers have deletions in RB and P53 as well, as you will see. Uh, and this has gone through a phase three for bladder cancer where they inject it right into the bladder lumen. That's what we mean by intravesicle. Why does this preferentially replicate in RB deficient tumors? Now we're going to go back to, to see about transformation, if you remember any of that. Remember, adenovirus has this transcriptional program. The virus genome gets in, it makes E1A first, which activates the early promoter, and you then make the E2 proteins, and then you get late transcription. But in order to get E2, you need the E2F family of transcription factors. And those are normally tied up in the cell by RB. So there's E2F that adenovirus needs for the early gene transcription, normally bound up by RB. So E1A, which is made first, bumps RB off of uh, E2F, frees up E2F so that you can now get the uh, early gene synthesis. These vectors, now again, remember in many tumors, RB is missing. So E2F is free. These vectors, uh, what they have is E1A driven by an E2F promoter. So they've taken out the E1A promoter, which normally works in every cell, substitute with E2F, which will only work in an RB deficient tumor. It needs E2F in order to replicate. If there's RB around, it won't infect, but in many tumors, RB is missing, so E2F is available, and that will activate this promoter. It'll make E1A, there's E1A, uh, which will then uh, lead to the activation of downstream genes, and they have uh, a GMCSF gene incorporated into that. So this is beautiful because it's been modified so that it will only work in RB-deficient tumors. There's another one uh, called Oncorine. It's licensed in China for treatment of head and neck tumors. And there, the viral E1B55K gene has been deleted. And I told you a long time ago, it seems, that E1B55K is needed to send P53 to be degraded. Remember, when adenovirus gets in the cell, it inactivates RB, it frees up E2F, the virus begins to replicate, but then P53 says, ah, it's unscheduled, we're going to apoptose this cell. So we want to get rid of P53, and that's what E1B does. So they deleted the E1B gene from the virus, and it will only replicate in P53 deficient tumors. Another brilliant way of leveraging what we understand about transformation to make a virus that is specific for the tumor. So, of course, this is a post-entry specificity. A vaccinia virus has been leveraged, another one for treating tumors. Uh, this is one where we've put GMCSF in. We've deleted the thymidine kinase gene to make it more specific for tumors. And in this trial, they said, can we give patients IV virus? Because you have many times where patients are full of metastases and you can't possibly inject the virus into every one of them. So can we design a vector that we put IV and then it will get to every tumor? And so they um, took 23 patients with advanced treatment refractory solid tumors in a variety of organs, as you can see there, and they delivered this to them. The um, virus also contained a beta gal gene so they could stain for virus infection in tissues. And here you can see from rectal, endometrial, and colon cancers, normal. They have a, a piece of cancer and a piece of normal tissue from each patient after injection of this virus, and you can see it replicates in most of these tumors uh, after intravenous inoculation. So in half of the patients, the virus replicated and 
that's after intravenous delivery. And so this is a proof of concept that tells us we could think about using this as a way to get highly met metastatic tumors. Uh, I mentioned this briefly in the, a few slides ago, but arming these oncolytic viruses with prodrug convertases, the idea here is that you are infecting a patient with an oncolytic virus, and it is going into the tumor cell. You've got it specific for the tumor cell. Let's give it a prodrug convertase so it will also make an active drug out of a prodrug. And here are three different ones. Thymidine kinase will, will convert gancyclovir to G triphosphate. Cytosine deaminase converts fluorocytosine to 5-FU. And these and others will inhibit DNA synthesis. They're chain terminators, but they have to be activated. So you infect your patient with your oncolytic virus. You then give them the prodrug. Prodrug has no effect on an uninfected cell because the virus is not there to provide the convertase. But in the infected cell, it will convert uh, the drug to a toxic drug, which will kill the cell. And that drug will spread to other cells as well and could inhibit synthesis in them. That's the idea of putting prodrug convertases into these vectors. And an example of this is a virus called TOCA511. Uh, this is a retrovirus. It's an amphotropic marine retrovirus. Amphotropic means it will infect many different cell types. It's got cytosine deaminase in it. This is given right into the tumor or intravenously, along with 5-fluorocytosine. So the idea is you have a tumor here. Uh, you inject the virus into the tumor. You then give the patients 5-fluorocytosine intravenously. It would get into many tissues, but only in the cells where the virus is making the prodrug convertase. Would it be uh, converted to 5-fluorouracil, which is then a chain terminator? And that would presumably be, make it specific uh, for the tumor. And this is in phase one and two for uh, gliomas. Another picornavirus, this is poliovirus, has been modified to treat tumors. And this is the Sabin strain of polio, which is the vaccine strain. And this was modified by replacing the internal ribosome entry site, that 5 prime N, which is highly structured, they took it in the Sabin strain, replaced it with the sequence from rhinovirus. And this, of course, was done by manipulating the infectious DNA, just like all the other examples I've given you so far. This turned out to make the virus completely attenuated, and it is specific for glioma cells. It turns out that tumor cells upregulate the polio receptor, and this makes them highly specific. And it was in a phase two for glioma, where the virus is injected right into the brain tumor. And this got a lot of publicity as well, because there's no treatment for these gliomas. They're typically fatal. But here is the result uh, from this trial. The median survival, 12 and a half months versus 11.3 months in the control. So you get an extra month or so of life. So presumably, we can do better, right? But this is an idea that uh, can be built on. This got a lot of publicity that we're curing brain tumors, but we're not really. We're getting there by small steps. And the last virus uh, in terms of cancer therapy I have to tell you about because it was really the first that was exploited to try and treat tumors, and that's Reovirus. It's called Reolysin, and it's not modified, but this virus is not pathogenic for people, and it was found to kill cells that have an activated RAS Pathway, this is one of those oncogenes that gets turned on and transforms cells. For some reason, real virus likes to replicate in those cells. And this has been in up to phase three trials for uh, head and neck tumors and many other types of tumors as well. And the company is Oncolytics Biotech Incorporated. It's out of uh, Canada, Western Canada. And before we leave tumors, I want to remind you that the efficacy of all these oncolytic viruses is not just because they kill tumor cells, but they also produce other products that may be involved, but they also activate the adaptive immune response, which is pretty much ignoring these tumor cells. But if you start to kill them and release proteins, stimulate inflammation, then you're going to get a better immune response against the tumor. So we're learning very slowly. It's not just the virus killing the cells, but we're actually recruiting immune cells. So here we have a, 
a tumor cell that's infected with vectors, it's releasing viral proteins. And these are picked up by antigen-presenting cells as we talked about a while ago. And these, of course, will turn on B and T cell responses, and they'll be directed against the tumor. It's a virus-infected tumor. So it's not just the virus killing it, but it's amplifying the general innate and adaptive responses against the tumor. Finally, one last application, which has had a lot of publicity lately, of course, last year's Nobel Prizes went to people who developed CAR-T immunotherapy. This is another way of killing cancer cells. Uh, it involves the design of a chimeric antigen receptor. We take, and that's shown on the left here, we design a single chain antibody directed against some tumor antigen that we've defined to be on the tumor that we want to destroy. So we, we, we make this chimeric protein which consists of the single chain antibody and a variety of co-stimulatory domains which will activate T cells to kill the tumor. We deliver this gene in a lentivirus vector. And the way this is done, we, we harvest T cells from the patient, we put them in culture, we infect with a lentivirus vector producing this CAR domain protein. It's produced in the T cells, and then we put them back into the patient. They now have this chimeric antigen receptor on their surface, which will uh, recognize the tumor antigen, and then it will direct the T cells to kill those cells. And so this is immunotherapy, but again, it uses lentivirus vectors in order to achieve that. Everything I've told you today has been made possible because of basic research. And this is my last kind of preaching to you. I've preached a lot to you this year. But all of this is possible because we've made fundamental advances in virology, recombinant DNA, immunology, clinical science as well. And a lot of the things I have taught you have all come to fruition today in the design of these vectors. And so as we move forward, we always have to have a balance between basic science and what we call translational science, putting the application of that into use to treat patients. There's a, there's a trend towards doing more and more translational and ignoring the basic science, but there won't be any translation if we don't continue to make basic science uh, advances. And I just want to say two more things. First of all, I want to thank you for taking this course. This is day one, long time ago. <laughs> there, is a, there is a survey over at CourseWorks where you can say what you liked and didn't like about the course, please take it. Finish your quizzes. If anything, please don't forget what I've taught you. If you go on into medicine, this will be relevant as you see. If you do other things, it's gonna be relevant as well. And as you know, I'm crazy <laughs> about viruses. I wear them on my car. I do lots of podcasting and videos and blogging. So follow me and keep in touch and you know, learn about viruses from time to time. It has been my honor to teach you. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you remember one thing, please always be curious. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week. Thank you.